one, then whatever 135 is. So that's 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 5, 1s, 3, zeros. There you go. All right, now my subnet max. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. Okay, so now look at it. We'll just compare it again. Yes, 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 no, 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 no. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, 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 no. No, 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 yes, no, yes, no. And then, yes. I'm sorry, I forgot to turn that on. Right? Okay, so I've got the binary of my number, the binary of my subnet mask, but if you'll notice, this matches this. Why? Because all of these bits are turned on. So this is going to match this, which means that's going to be 192. This matches this, which means that's 168. This matches this, which means it's 10. This is now different, so whenever I add the values here, that's 128. Now, do you see how if I'm dealing with a class C address, I can technically <laughs> ignore all of this? Because as soon as the 24th bit is turned on, all of this is set in stone. So even if I use anding for the entire address, the first three are going to match because I've already turned on the first 24 bits. They're going to match automatically. So me personally, I don't like doing extra work. I just ignore the first three. If this number's higher than 24, I ignore the first three. I ignore this one, I ignore this one, I ignore this one, until I'm writing the answer. Then I remember, it can't just be the fourth octet, got to write the first one. But as soon as the 24 is turned on, those are set in stone. Because remember, it's 255, so there's only one address that would work. And since there's only one address that will work, then we know what those addresses are. So that's why I only focus on the, um, on the fourth octet with the class C. It makes it a little bit easier for me to teach y'all subdating, especially with the fact that towards the end of the semester, I'm not going to do it till we get past all of the big stuff, but at the end of the semester, I'm going to teach y'all the little trick of the trade as far as uh, subnetting uh, class A's and class B's. Okay, so we're going to do that later. I don't want to confuse nobody with it now. All right, so. Now, we're going to shift into this. So, we can actually answer the same questions I kind of wanted to make it where you can still see the questions. Alright, so there's the questions that we've got. And we can still kind of, we can still answer them. But now here's the difference with class list subnet is that this is more of a real world environment. So I would have like say an Atlanta office and a Birmingham office and a Chicago office and they would have different amounts of people there, right? Now, one thing I want you to remember is this. A, these numbers are set in stone. They cannot be changed. So whenever I'm looking at this, I have to get as close as I can without going under. Okay, because I've got to have 100 addresses that I can dish out. Just like I've got to have 50 addresses I can dish out. I've got to have 13 addresses that I give out. Those, that's the number of addresses I have to have to assign to devices. So I can't have under this number of usable addresses. Okay. Now, with that being kept in mind, in this class, solely in this class, if you see this, 13, so I, off the top of my head, I know the closest to 13 without going under is going to be 16, right? 
It has that 16 total addresses, 14 that I can dish out, right? Okay, so that's 14 usable addresses I can dish out. Now, here is McSwain telling you, keep this in mind for the real world after you graduate. If I look at you and I say, there's 13 people in this building right now, I need 13 addresses. Thinking to myself, am I really going to assign that to a subnet mask that's only got 14 addresses? No. No, because you're telling me that they're never going to hire another person, they're going to hire another department, they're never going to do anything. This is going to stay 13 for the rest of its life. And if they do hire another person, after that 14th person, everybody to hire, they're going to fire somebody. No. Account for growth. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Now, I don't want that to throw you off in here. Because in here, if it says 13, you would give it that because they're not accounting for growth. Netacad in this class and on the test, they don't account for growth. I'm telling you, don't be naive. Learn from the mistakes of others. Don't be naive. If I tell you these 13 people here, I would say give them the 32, because then that way you've got about 17 or yeah, 17 more addresses that could be dished out. So if somebody pops up and says, hey, guess what? We hired another department. We got 10 more people. You're not going, no. You're going, oh, okay, yeah, because just give them dot whatever through dot whatever. They're good. So you don't have to change anything. You don't have to change your setup or anything. And I'm going to show you why you account for growth and why that's a good thing. So, first off, just like I drew this on the board last time, what's missing? The connection. So we've got to have a one-to-one -one connection that goes from each of them. Okay? So, I drew this with letters. But what I should have done was this. So we got, and I actually did them in order. Now in the real world too, keep this in mind, this is different from the tests in here. If they tell you it's A, B, and C, subnet is A, B, and C. In the real world, you want to put your biggest number first. Which site's got the most addresses? You want to keep that chunk kind of in the front. And so on and so forth. So I went ahead and did it. So you got, it's the best of both worlds. But anyway, so I've got, the router 1 connection, the router 2 connection, and the router 3 connection. Okay? So I've got to account for those. Router 1, router 2, router 3. Now, this is why, this is more of the reason why I like my chart than the cyber style. Because with the cyber style, I can do anding and kind of answer the questions a lot faster. But with this method, you can't do anding. Because the subnet mask changes. Why does the subnet mask change? Because for every site, I've got to turn on a different bit. Okay? So, for this site, I've got to turn on what bit? The 128 bit. Because that gives me 126 usable addresses for this site. So if I turn on that one bit, then the subnet mask for this site becomes 255.255.255.128. Okay, that's fine. So that tells me if I go over here to my chart for site A, I've got 128 total addresses. Just like we did with the previous section, you do the same thing. 0 plus 128 is going to equal 128. So if I subtract 1 from 128, then my broadcast of the previous network is 127. So everything from site A, I can dish out from 1 to 126. Okay, done. Site A is now accounted for. I can dish out from 1 to 126. So that handles all 100 devices at site A. So now I go to site B. Site B has 50 that they need. Okay, well if I leave this bit turned on and I make this a 128 as well, what happens to site C? I have no more addresses to dish out, right? 
because that's the end of my that's the end of my class C addresses. Because if I cut it in half, right now here's what our chart looks like. Our chart looks like this with class A being from zero to 127. Okay, so if I leave that subnet mass there, I would have class B, but where's class C gonna go? I'm out of addresses. Now, two options to handle that. The first option is the way we're gonna handle it. We're gonna redo the subnetting and make another subnet of a different size. The other way is, is that some places actually would say, okay, this site's going to be 192.168.10.0. This site's going to be 192.168.11.0. This one's going to be 192.168.12.0. That is a viable option. If you expect that you're going to have eventually 254 things on that site, that is absolutely A-OK. -okay. It's not necessary, but it's okay. So what we're going to do, though, is we're not going to do that. We want to stay with the 192.168.10.0, which is a classic. We want to keep that. We're happy with it. We've added up the value of all of these, so that's 150, 163. We're way below 256. Okay, we're, we're good. We got enough we can use. All right, so I've got site B. So what I need to do is I need how many addresses. I've got to have 50 I can give away. So, what bit would I turn on that is higher than 50, but not too high? So we would turn on the 64 bit. So whenever we turn on the 64 bit, we've now made the subnet mask of this guy, 255.255.255.192. Because we add these two values together to get the subnet mask for this site. Now, we look at the bit we've turned on. We got 64 total addresses. Come back up to our chart. So now we would say 128 plus 64. So that would be two, carry the one, eight. So the, sub -net the network address of site C is going to be 120 or 182 because 128 plus 64, 182. Okay. Wait, 192. You're right, I had to catch that. Thank you. Like I said, I make mistakes, 192, thank you. So, for site C, the first address is gonna be 192. So, to get the broadcast for site B, we subtract one, and that would be 191. So, now we can dish out everything from 129 to 190. Wow, that just got worse. So everything from 129 to 190 would go here. And the network address for site B would be 128, and the broadcast is 191. The last one, if you know, you know. 150, 163, plus six. So we've got 169 addresses that we've got, so we're well under the 254 mark. We're gonna have to end with 255, but I wanna show you what's gonna happen. So what I've done now is by turning on this other bit, I've cut it in half again, and I've got 128 to 191. See how this is working, how we're kind of just, we're dividing it up in the chunks that we need. So, with having to have 13, like I said, for this class, we would, we would have to turn on all the bits until we get to the 16th bit. So then we would add those values. 128, 192, 224, 240. So now the subnet mask for this one is 255, 255, 255, 255.240. Okay, so we've got 16. So 192 plus 16 is 208. So then we subtract one, that's 207. And then everything in between from 193 to 206 is usable for site C. By turning on to the 16th bit, we got 14 usable, right? Because if it's a total of 16, we subtract two to get our usable. In the class, we're not, we're not accounting for growth here. 
we're saying we've got 14 usable addresses. But because it's 16 total, we take that 16 and add it to the previous network address. So, so that gives us 208. Now for the routers, this is a little bit easier because we know we're going to turn on every bit till we get to the four because we want a direct one-to-one -one connection, right? We want to broadcast a network and then one-to-one -one because we need one connection here and one connection here, okay? So by turning on to that fourth bit for our routers, the subnet mask is going to be 255.255.255. Dot .255 .255 say 256, that would be 255, 253, yeah, 253, no, 252. So, but that's going to be the subnet mask for all three of these. So since it's four, now on my chart I can go a little bit easier. Oh, forgot to do this. So for class C, we divided it in again, and we went from 192, to 207, and that's our C. Now, for the routers, this one's pretty easy because you can say, okay, 208, 209, 210, 211, 212, 218, 219, and then now 220 would be the next network. So what we've done now is we've cut out three little chunks for our routers. So then what that leaves is, is everything from 220 to 255 is now whatever we want it to be. You just don't worry about it. Why? Why? Because what if I come up to you and I say, okay, great news, everybody. Great, great news. You'll be glad to know that McSwain Incorporated is now expanding. We're expanding, and we're actually going to be having another site in Delaware. And in Delaware, we're going to have 30 people. So now, I can say, okie dokie, that's fine by me. It's going to look a little stupid, but I can just say Delaware, and then router 4 and router 5, because I've got this and this. So now our little chart would go, instead of being question marks, it would look like this. And then two more chunks for routers. Isn't that fun? This looks like doo-doo. This actually makes sense. Now do you see why I like my chart? This is what I do. Everybody else that was teaching me is like, oh yeah, you go back to that and I'm like, okay, yeah, no, I'm good. That looks crazy. I'm not doing that. I'll do this. Because then I'm not thinking of it looking like that. I'm just saying, oh, okay, yes, the next usable number. Now, here's the question, though. If I didn't account for growth in the real world, let's say, oh, guess what? I've hired 20 more, or, you know, 20 people total. Well, now this chunk becomes useless because it only has 14 usable addresses in it. So then you would actually have to come down here and make this C, and then D would be way down here. Or like most people do in the real world, because D because D's already been created, you would come down here at the end and create C, and now you got this big chunk of 14 that you gotta wait and hope that they say, oh, guess what, we're making another one, and this is gonna be a little tiny spot that we're gonna call E, which in Europe, and it's only gonna have 13 people in it. Bink. It really convoluted really fast. That's why I like the graph. Because with the graph, no matter how I change it up, no matter what, how many sites are, I can just add the numbers down, subtract one to get my broadcast, and then everything in between goes. Okay, now I know this looks really convoluted, y'all. I don't expect y'all to know this today. We're still focusing on this back here for the next little while. I just wanted to introduce this, and then we're going to keep doing it more and more and more. Okay? 
okay? So if this right here, you're sitting back there in your, in your seat going, it's okay. It's absolutely a-okay. I just want you to see, I'm not even really to tell you all the truth, I'm not even worried about this part of it more than you remember that this still exists. Whether it's a cider or with a class full subnetting or whether it's class list subnetting, this still works. Because this is McSwain approved. All right, are we good? Y'all thoroughly confused now? <clears throat> I win. Because that's what I do. I wake up every morning and I'm like, you know what? I bet you I could really tick some students off if I just throw some just off-the-wall crazy crap at them. And then I go, you know what? Class is Sunday something we don't even have to talk about until chapter 15, but who cares? They're at chapter 5. They'll get it. I'm kidding, y'all. The more we do it, the easier it's going to get. I promise you, it will get easier. It gets easier and easier and easier. And the main reason that I like doing it over and over and over again is because by the time you get into CCNA 2 and CCNA 3, you're going to be doing this in minutes. I mean minutes. Not, not, I'm not talking like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. I'm talking like 5. Because all of this stuff is going to make way more sense. All right, how are we looking on time? Now, really what this is, is you know how last week we talked about the physical layer. We talked about the media. We talked about the NIC. We talked about how the media interacts with the NIC. Okay, the reason that the TCP IP model combines the data link layer with the physical layer is because with the OSI model, they are separate. But technically, in reality, they are together. Because if you think about it in terms of IT, think about it in terms of the way that you as IT people probably know. You already know what firmware is, right? Firmware is what tells the hardware what to do. That's a term you've probably heard and you're aware of. Well, that's the concept of the data link layer versus the physical layer. The physical layer would be the hardware and then the data link layer would be the firmware which tells the hardware what to do. Okay, so when I said converting it from a frame into binary and all that stuff, it is the data link that actually tells it to do that. Okay? And that's what we're talking about. So we're merely just kind of adding on to what we've already talked about with the physical layer. So in this layer, we are actually giving it the protocols for layer two and layer three. Layer two would be your switches. They only care about the MAC address. That's it. It does not care about the IP address. Okay, a layer three device, like a router, doesn't care about the MAC address. It only cares about the IP address. So in other words, for information to go from your computer outside of your network, it has to have both. But for it to stay internal into the LAN, it really only needs the MAC address because it's only the layer two devices that are communicating with it. Unless you're like, say, in a different building, so you have a router between buildings. Then you have to add the layer three because if you don't have an IP address, the router's not gonna be able to do nothing with it. So just keep that in mind. Really what I'm getting at, that I really wanna just thump into your skull is the fact of switches, layer two, MAC address only. Routers, layer three, IP address only. They only focus on one thing that they care about. Switches are MAC addresses, routers are IP addresses. But you have to have two, both of them, for them to interact. Even though one ignores the other, they still have to be there, okay? So the data link layer is the one that puts it there. Now, whenever you get into the data link layer, you start getting into the sub-layer or the, the sub-layers of the encapsulation process, okay? In the sub-layers, you have the logic link control, which communicates between the network software. That's where it tells the NIC what's plugged into it. Is it Wi-Fi? Is it a NIC? I mean, is it an Ethernet? Is it fiber optic? What is it? And then you have the media access control. 
Okay, so the media access control or the MAC sublayer is not to be confused with the MAC address. They are two different things. The MAC address is what's built into the NIC. The MAC sublayer is the media access control. That's the encapsulation of what type of media it is. So you got the logic, which is the software between the two, the type that converts it. And then you got the MAC, which is what encapsulates it so it can go across that net. Okay? So you need those two sublayers to say, okay, logically this is uh, fiber optic, so I know here's how to convert it into, into pulses. Media access says, okay, give me all of the information and then I'll send it out via those pulses. Okay? Now, you've got packet exchange between the two. So at each hop, the router performs four basic layer two functions. It accepts the frame from the network medium, it de-encapsulates it, then it re-encapsulates it, and then it forwards it on. Okay, here is the best way I can word that to you. It is going to sound confusing, bear with me. Think about writing a letter. Okay, you are writing a physical layer to your best friend. When you take that letter or that data that you've written out, you fold it, you put it in an envelope. Okay, when you put it in that envelope, what do you write on the outside of that envelope? You write the address that it's going to, and then you write the address it's coming from. So you've got the destination and you've got the source. Now, when you are looking at the destination and the source of a regular letter it is basically the same as looking at the IP address and the MAC address. So y'all remember me telling you you're the, you're the mayor of the town. You're the network administrator. Your town, you got the east side, you got the west side, you got the toll booth that's between the two. Y'all remember that analogy? Okay, so when you're writing a letter and you've got that address, and you've got that return address, and you've got that stamp. Okay, what you're now looking at is remember that we've got our, we've got our town. Okay, and in our town, we've got several different houses. It's amazing how my houses look like a isn't it? There's a reason for that. So, we now got Okay, so we've now got the east side of town with our houses and our roads communicating and then we've got our toll bridge that goes to our route, right? Same as I told y'all with our previous analogy. So what you're doing here is whenever you're writing that, that physical street address. So here's my question. Now keep in mind, I realize that people live in apartments, okay? So, and I realize that not everybody lives alone. But whenever you're writing a letter to your friend, is there anybody else located at that physical ground spot other than your friend? Or at least the domicile that your friend lives in. Typically, no. There's just that one. There's just one building there. Your friend is in that building. Okay, so what you're telling me is, is that if I send it to this physical address, 1234 Happy Time Street, that that is the only building at 1234 Happy Time Street. Yes, it is. Because there's only can be one thing located at that location. So, your street name... Uh, I'll fall down. Don't get that on video. <laughs> is your MAC address. That's your street name. That is your physical location. Nobody else can be here but the person that I'm sending this letter to. Alright? So, then if I say the city and state and the zip code, 
Well, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's located in that city and state, right? I mean, even if I said Podunk, Alabama, there's probably more than two houses there. So even if you said something off the wall like that or some little small town USA, there's still probably going to be more than one house there for it to be considered a town. So that is actually the IP address because what I'm saying is, is okay, I'm sending this letter from me to them And it's going from me to the my router, my gateway, and then it's going from that router to the next nearest one, 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 until it gets here, and then it's going to say, oh, okay, yeah, I know that IP address. That's part of my town. That's the toll booth operator gets this and goes, yeah, that's part of my town. So now what does it do with it? It hands it to the end of the toll booth or the switch, and it says, okay, this is in town. Now you give it to whoever it goes to. And then the switch says, oh, okay, I know that MAC address. They're plugged into port five. Here you go, there's your packet. There's your letter. Now, the only thing different between normal mail in the mail system and in routing and switching is this. When you mail a letter, you put that letter in the mailbox and then it's gone, right? And then you know that it gets there whenever that person calls you up and goes, oh, I love my Christmas card, or whatever, when they get it. Okay, so when it comes to networking, how do we know we got it? How do they know they got it? Well, here's what happens. When you write your letter, you actually are putting that letter inside another envelope. So imagine taking the letter you wrote, you put it in the envelope, and then you stick that envelope into a big manila envelope or a FedEx box. Okay? And then they say, oh, okay, this letter is going to Atlanta. Well, you're in Pensacola right now, so you got it to the mailbox. The post office person looks at that big envelope and says, oh, it's going to Atlanta. What's the nearest hub? Oh, it's that one. Throw it in that bag, and then whenever it gets to that post office, they take it out and goes, oh, okay, we got them going here and here. That one's going to Atlanta. Put it in that bag, and then it goes on. So you've got different post office hops until it gets to the city and state where you sent it to, right? That's common sense. We all know that. The only difference here is, is that picture, every time it gets to one of these locations, that big box that you put your letter in, the post office opens it looks at it and says, oh, okay, yeah, it's going there. So then that post office puts it in another box, puts them as being the sender, and then sends it to the next hop. Then the next hop, they open it, verify it's good, put it back in, in another box, put them as the sender, and sends it to the next hop. Okay, that sounds really convoluted, right? I mean, like, exceedingly convoluted that every post office it gets to, somebody opens it, puts it in a new box, says that they're the sender, not you, and sends it on to the next location. Why is that convenient, or why is that a good idea? Okay, here's why. Two reasons. One, every time that that box is open, and they look at your letter, they're verifying that nobody's tampered with it. They're making sure that nobody's put any malicious code in, that it's still the same size as it was whenever it left your computer. And then they're saying like, okay, I've checked it, it's good, sending it to the next one. Okay, I've checked it, it's good, send it to the next one. Okay, I've checked it, it's good, until it gets all the way here, and then after all of these have checked it and sent it on, and then they say, hey, here you go, it's all good. I didn't have to drop it, you know, there ain't no whatever, nobody's dipped it in cyanide or nothing, the letter's good, you can send it on to that person. Okay, now, the second reason why it's a good thing that it opens it. Because now, what do we know? We actually now know the path that it took because each one of these calculates the fastest route to get from you. So even the internet, we're talking, we're in the cloud now, ladies and gentlemen. So there's 
crowd is everyone. So they're saying, okay, I have determined that this path is the fastest one because this guy's slow as dirt. That guy's only a half a router because it drew it like crap. And then all of these other ones have got bottlenecks and issues. So this is the fastest route. We're going this way. So now that they've opened it up and said, I was the sender at every one of them, now this person goes, oh, I love my Christmas card. I'm going to send you one back. Guess which way it's going? The exact same path to get back to you. Would you consider this a secure net, though? Hmm? Would this be considered a secure net? Yes and no. This is a way of error-checking packets, but is it considered as secure? No. Now, 